Kudos to Kirk and Rob in the sound booth who followed along <laughs> in English. That's reading. Wonderful job. Will you pray with me? Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on us. Open our ears and our hearts and our minds to the revelation that is your good news today and every day. Amen. When I was in high school, about 16 or 17 years old, I had a friend named Amber who had an older brother named AJ. Amber and I were very good girls, but AJ was a little rebellious. And for those of you who don't know, I grew up in the independent fundamentalist Baptist cult. And so, AJ, AJ snuck a copy, a VHS copy of The Exorcist into the house. And Amber and I spent weeks planning a Friday the 13th sleepover in which we would huddle ourselves in her room and watch this forbidden film. Finally, the day came, and we had AJ's copy of The Exorcist. It was Friday the 13th, and we waited until about midnight to start the movie. And Amber had one of those great TV VH or VCR combos in her bedroom. And I'd never known anybody who had a TV in their bedroom who was my age. So I was so excited as we sat down together at around midnight and popped this movie in and turned off the lights and sat and watched The Exorcist. It wasn't until 10 to 15 minutes in the movie when we realized we'd made a terrible mistake. <laughs> we turned the lights on in the bedroom and decided to watch this horrific film <laughs> with the lights on. And still we sat next to each other, squeezing one another, terrified of what we were seeing on the screen. We were so engrossed in this horrifying film that we did not notice as the door crept open. And AJ snuck his hand in, flipped up the lights and slammed the bedroom door. Well, you can imagine the chaos that erupted in the room now filled with darkness with only the glow of the exorcist film with profuse vomiting from the individual on screen. We were terrified. And so we grabbed each other even tighter and we screamed for our lives. And we began to pray, dear Jesus, please forgive us. We are so sorry. It wasn't until we heard laughter from outside the door that we figured something else was afoot. Eventually, AJ reached, opened the door, turned on the lights, and we knew we had been punked. But oh, that moment when the lights came on again. An absolute relief filled our spirits. The room in that moment went from absolute chaos to calm. The power of light in the darkness. Let there be light, God declared, according to the Hebrew and Christian creation stories. The very first thing that God did to turn the chaos into order in the initial act of creation was to make light shine into the darkness. Light, therefore, is the most basic reality upon which all of creation rests. In our scripture reading from John, the, the gospel writer places in the mouth of Jesus the claim that he is the same as that light. Indeed, the very light of the whole world. Now, this language that, language that John chooses in his claim about Jesus may remind us of some passages in the Hebrew scriptures, going back as far as Genesis chapter 15, verse 1, where we see the very first I am statement of God, a statement that we have decided to live into during this Lenten season as we, as we deliver messages and sermons and create our worships around those I am statements inspired by Yahweh, the Hebrew God. 
In fact, I am is said so many times in the Old Testament that the Hebrew God is often called the great I am. In Hebrew, one of the names for God that I just said, Yahweh, is connected to the verb which means I am. So when Moses encountered God in the burning bush and asked of God, who should I tell the people sent me? God says, I am that I am. And so as the religious leaders of Jesus' day, the Pharisees, as they sat and listened to Jesus, sorry, my microphone keeps wandering away from my ear. As they sat and listened to Jesus declare, I am the light of the world, and whoever follows me will not walk in darkness. They surely would have known that Jesus was referencing his own I am statement. It is clear that the gospel writer was hoping to draw a direct line between God of the Hebrew text and Jesus in this moment. And that is precisely why the Pharisees were so offended by Jesus' claim for himself and why they scolded him. You can't testify to this about yourself, they said to him. In other words, who are you to say you're the light of the world? And so they ask, in accordance with Jewish law, who else is able to corroborate your claim that you are what you say you are? Imagine how incensed they must have been when Jesus says, the one who's corroborating my testimony is the great I am. Oh, how dare he? Now, what's interesting about the gospel writer's desire to draw a connecting line between the Yahweh of the Hebrew Bible, the I am of God, and Jesus's I am in John, is exactly what this line of connection means for how we then interpret Jesus' claim as the light of the world. I think the best way to understand how we can wrap our heads around Jesus as the light of the world is to look back at how the Hebrew God, how the first I am, showed up to God's people. We should particularly consider the ways that the Hebrew people encountered the presence of God in their midst as they journeyed through the wilderness. Why this moment, you might ask? Well, most biblical scholars agree that the Exodus story is the central narrative to the Jewish faith. It is their origin story, if you will. It is the defining moment for the Hebrew people wandering in the wilderness, escape from Egypt. So let's look at this most important moment. In Exodus chapter 13, verses 21 and 22, the scriptures tell us that the Lord went before the people by day in a pillar of cloud and at night by a pillar of fire to light the way in the dark. Ah, the first light of the world. Was the Hebrew God, I am. And then centuries later, or generations later, Jesus comes along and says, I am now just like that pillar of fire that led our people through the wilderness. I am the very incarnation of God with us, always and forever lighting the way. Now I have, have you ever seen these lights that mimic the sun's rays? I have a light in my office right now that is the sunlight. And on days when the winter gloom gets to be a little too much, amen if you know what I'm talking about. Nobody knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> amen, right? On days when the winter gloom gets to be a little too much and my spirit feels a little bit blue, I can turn that light on. It isn't a magic pill, but boy, does it help to turn that light on and be and bask in the light of the sun without the actual sun being present. Light is perhaps the most powerful force in nature. 
Light can literally alter the chemistry in our brain. It can destroy bad and sick cells. Sometimes light can be revolutionary. There is a reason that the international symbol for a groundbreaking thought is what over the head? A light bulb. And this moment is called when you have a, a revolutionary idea that can change the whole course of human history. It is called a what? A light bulb moment or a bright idea. Ah, the power of light. Sometimes light can be freeing and healing. For that person who steps into the spotlight at an AA meeting for the very first time and says, Hi, I have a problem and I need some help. Ah, in that moment, a light inside their being spills into the darkness, illuminating secrets that had the power to destroy that person's soul until the light finds them and sets them free. I am the light of the world, Jesus says. Follow me so that you don't walk in darkness again. Now light, the very light of the world, is capable of all of those things, and we are blessed because of it. But that same light of the world who illuminates our path and shines in the darkness and shows us God with us also shines in places that we'd probably rather keep dark. Amen? As comforting and revolutionary and freeing as the light of God's love is, it can also be devastating. Sometimes that pervasive light is just like that bright, harsh, fluorescent light that is in virtually every dressing room across America. You know that light that I'm talking about. There is that moment when you find something on the rack that you love. You take it to the dressing room to try it on. And as soon as you put it on and you see yourself on all four sides. <laughs> with that light above you, it doesn't even resemble the thing that you just saw on the rack a moment ago. And standing under that buzzing, flickering, harsh light that will not allow any part of you to remain hidden, all you can do is get out as fast as you can. Well, the light of the world shines just like that, too. And oh, when it does, it is excruciating to face ourselves, to feel exposed, to feel so deeply known. But the light of the world loves us too much to let us remain there in that space. During this Lenten season, we are invited to consider those shadowy corners of our souls. We are encouraged to confess those choices that we've made that turn off the light. Now, I want to be sure you hear me when I say I'm not talking about mental health and the type of darkness that invades the mind because of illness. Rather, I'm talking about our shadow selves, the sides of us that can be cruel or selfish or greedy or judgmental. Jesus is the I am who shines light in the most terrifying and difficult ways. But never in ways that are meant to shame us. For shame has no place in a relationship that is filled with grace. Shame is unholy, it is hateful, and it is not from God. And so if a light has been shown on you in a way that causes you to feel shame, friends, I encourage you, that is not from the light of the world. Grace is what is present in the light. Now in my mind, the light of the world is, like Adam said, like this flashlight. It can shine outward and light a path. It can show me and you the way to go, it can pierce through the darkness and bring calm in moments of chaos. But it can also be turned around to shine a light right on me or you in a way that is uncomfortable. And remember that trick we did in middle school where we shone the light in our skin? Just like that, the light also shines in us. 
and then we become the light. In fact, in the, ba- in the math- Gospel of Matthew, Jesus doesn't claim himself to be the light of the world. Instead, he says to his disciples, you are the light of the world. In partnership with the grand I am light of the world, you and I have the opportunity to become light. God with us. God in us, God for us, God through us. We are the light of the world. Let us walk in that light. The the light of the world shines on us in the ways that hurt us and then heal us. Be that light. Embrace that light. Live into that light. Amen. Amen.